November or February 4th uh, work session of the Jackson County uh, Board of Education to order. Um, all members are present with the exception of Mr. Hollett. Uh, he's called away on a uh, work emergency, but uh, we understand he's going to try and join us uh, virtually. So we look forward to that. Um, I'd like to move into the, the agenda. Uh, first item up. Uh, superintendent's comments, Dr. Howard. All right. Thank you, Mr. Clarice and board, and thank you all for being here. Um, very few comments, just a couple of reminders. We do have our board meeting on Monday evening. Uh, it will be here, so we look forward to, to ha having everyone here, uh, but the, we'll ask again for staff to remain um, in a remote setting so that we can honor our guidelines that are still in place, but this is working well for us now. Another reminder, this is a very busy budget and personnel season, so we're looking forward to our retreat scheduled for March 4th and 5th. The agenda is there for public review, but our board members have already been a, a part of helping us craft that, and we're looking forward to meeting um, as a group, but then also bringing in the Board of Commissioners and doing some um, intergovernmental partnership work, so that should be a really, really good two days. Um, we're going to start our day here and do the, do the meeting and so forth here. And then we will go over to Jackson County High School to the Empower Center in the afternoon for Mr. Chronic's uh, retirement reception that we had to reschedule from December. So that'll be at five o'clock. And then that um, evening we will have our Parent Advisory Council and the Parent Advisory Council agenda will be focused on touring Empower and lifting it up. And then we will have um, guest visit who are uh, community members who have formed the SPLOS campaign committee. So they're going to explain to our families what SPLOS is and make sure they understand the upcoming vote in, on March the 16th. So that should be a, a really, really good day. So outside of that, we were very excited to have our children start back in school this week. And uh, so far, so good. We've uh, Dr. Blankenship and, and Mr. Johnson are, are tag teaming on forming those numbers, but I think cursory, we, we've got about 16 to 18 staff cases and about 30 student cases. That's just a guesstimate, but they, they'll update us tomorrow and um, make sure that we get that out. But at this point, we're looking forward to just keeping on, keeping on. So we'll hope for the best and, and do that. Yeah, right. Yes, yes. So um, <clears throat> if we could go ahead and look at our facilities and operations, Mr. Gilbert, you're with us. You want to, uh, you and potentially Mr., uh, excuse me, Mr. Patton, go over our projects list. We'll be pleased to, uh, Dr. Howard and board members. Uh, you've got, we only have one item tonight and that's the uh, monthly projects report. You'll find on the first page just uh, the percentages of where we are in various portions of the high school building. And you'll get a pretty good feel for the fact that we're well along and actually doing some final cleaning in some areas. Um, outside of that, we're working pretty steadily right now on uh, uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. We've got a lot of that on this project that we're engaged in right now. Uh, we, you can get a, a look in the report on what we've, we've done or are doing for classrooms, for athletics, for furniture, uh, for facility needs. Some of this is, has uh, already been completed and purchase orders uh, out and others will be going out in the next few days. So um, lots of that activity, we wanna try and be ready on the facility later this spring. Uh, so we have plenty of time for everybody to move in and get adjusted and make that relocation as painful and uh, smooth as we can. Uh, the East Jackson Middle School renovation, I put in a little bit on that. Uh, we're, we're really complete on that project as far as the initial scope of work. We're going to close out documents and punch lists right now. There's really only one item on the punch list and the closing documents are being reviewed right now. Uh, Empower College and Career, the, the big item there, as you know, is phase two, which is coming up this summer. So it's been advertised now and the bid pricing is due in the end of this month. And I put a list in there, uh, kind of a summary of what scope of work will be included in that, primarily construction and welding and outdoor storage and un entrepreneurship in the E-Wing, film production in the uh, adjacent to the auditorium where the chorus is now, chorus and uh, drama. And then uh, we're adding a set of A-Wing uh, restrooms there for uh, the future need and we'll be painting corridors and doing some site improvements as well out near the uh, welding and construction. And then the last item on projects right now is 
uh, the Gum Springs Park parking lot. The design and bid package is out now and bids are due in uh, February 28th. So we'll know some something more about that in just a few weeks. Uh, beyond that, I provided the funding report. So you'll see the high school. And again, I highlighted in yellow, so you'll be able to just glance at what new items are in there versus last month. Uh, we are still in budget and haven't asked for any additional funding. So no changes at all on that. And everything is in, in good order. The next one is the Empower College and Career. And that, of course, is the first phase primarily. And you'll see where we are on that. And no changes in that budget either. Uh, we're still waiting on, of course, phase two. And then the last one is the East Jackson Middle School budget that uh, is essentially complete. We uh, received actually just a little while ago the final uh, refund of, uh, of remaining contingency dollars and the final pay application. I haven't looked at it yet, but it's uh, we're right there now. And then you'll see uh, some photos. We didn't have a whole lot this month, but you can see photos of the corridors and some classroom areas in the new school. You'll see the beautiful new gym and the floor, and it's uh, it's really phenomenal. Uh, it's a beautiful gymnasium. Uh, you'll see a little bit about the monumental stairs is what we call them out front where we have the indoor stadium seating and just a couple of others that uh, were taken. One of them I like is the classroom risers that uh, the, these are breakout areas. We have eight of these. So they're carpeted and ready for students and they connect on and, and with lots of glass on each side to an existing or to a classroom. So these will be small group areas where kids can go and, and uh, work on group projects. And then the last thing you'll see is uh, as of, uh, that's probably been a little bit of time, a couple, maybe 10 days or so, uh, that was the status of the field house down next to the stadium field. So lots going on over there and uh, it's, it's, as we've said all along, a really uh, beautiful project as long as, the, as are the other ones. So I'd be glad to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was waiting. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilbert. I will say that we were talking earlier when the board just arrived and the board would like to schedule a tour of the high school in the next week or so. Um, so I'll get with you and, and Mr. Patton and we'll schedule a time with our su superintendent over there to be able to look at that facility. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. We'll go back to our agenda. All right, Anna is Anna and Aaron, I believe, are both at the office. They're <laughs> recognizing our social distancing, so I can see you in your offices. But Anna, why don't you and Aaron take turns tag teaming on some good news? Um, well, I don't know. I can't. Okay, good. Yay! It's, it is first. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna uh, go out of order if it wasn't. Um, but the. Phenomenal, amazing news for SPLOS is that we had our first ex in excess of a million dollar deposit for um, for our monthly SPLOS deposit. So that is absolutely amazing. And I had to look several times to make sure I was looking at the right account because I mm -hmm. could probably believe it. Um, it's, it's a great, great, great thing to see. And um, it it happened a lot faster than what I thought, so it was a great surprise. Um, Anna, Anna, Aaron, and I were in a meeting, a SPLOS committee meeting earlier today, and Dr. Talbert, we, we were kind of quiet, and I said, Dr. Talbert, were you surprised? She said, I had to look at it twice. I thought it was wrong, so it sounds like across the across the across our area, so that's great, great yeah. news. Absolutely. And General then... For our um, general fund, Aaron, do you want to present general fund? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so we're at, um, gosh, my eye is watering, so I'm I'm cross-eyed. So <clears throat> we're at 58% of the year. And so when we look at revenues, we are well over 50% of web revenues. We're at 72%. Um, and then when we look at expenditures, we're at 57%. So consistently we're staying right on target with our expenditures, um, which I'm sure we can all appreciate given the circumstances of this year is really outstanding and speaks to the efforts everyone is contributing to, to 
not overspending and watching and making good financial choices of how to use the funds we have in the best possible ways. Um, anything you want to add to that, Anna? Just um, our, our ending fund balance for the month looks great. And um, if I project it out for the, for the rest of the year, it looks like even with, without considering midterm adjustment or any other CARES funding, that we're going to easily end the fiscal year at um, 20 million or more. So it's, it's, it's great timing because we have, we have some things that, that we can use it on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, and I appreciate both of you, everything you do, and, and Aaron's shout out to our schools. And so I, I, we'll be having some really rich conversations at our board retreat in March because this is what we've been striving for, was to get to a place that we had a little bit of flexibility. And now that we know that we are going to need to respond to the growth that's coming, uh, it, it's going to be really important that we have that because we can we can front load some of the needs that we're going to have uh, that are going to come around the corner quicker than we're going to be able to keep up with them, I'm afraid. So that's really, really, really good. So thank you so much to both of you. It's great. It's great news. So Dr. Blankenship is with us. And sadly, this is her last official meeting. Um, so Dr. Blankenship, I'll let you take on human resources for us. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Howard. And Yes, sadly, it's my last work session. Uh, I'll, I'll be at the board meeting uh, or be in the board meeting on uh, Monday, but I just, again, want to say thank you to everyone for four and a half wonderful, wonderful years here in Jackson County. Uh, and I will, I will miss working with all of you very, very much. So uh, the first item that we have here is our enrollment update. And I'd like for you to, to Take a good look at that. Um, I think that this really speaks to something that's not a surprise, but just the growth that we have been talking about and that we're hearing um, our, our county uh, partners talk about uh, that's coming. We have seen a net increase of over 300, about 318 students over the course of the year. And uh, if you look between December and January, it, typically between August and September and December and January, that's where you do see an increase. But over the course of the year, you might see a, a net decrease in your enrollment um, potentially, or at least stay stagnant. We're not seeing that. So between December and January, we had a net increase of 64 students. Um, and that is uh, our highest increase previous to that was from August to September, where we had a net increase of 42. So uh, other than that, we also gained a net increase of 36 between September and October. Um, interestingly and not surprisingly, the, most of this growth is coming on the west side. Um, all of our West Side schools saw a significant increase in the number of enrolled students over the course of this last month. Um, and that's just something that I would encourage the, the uh, board to um, be particularly mindful of as we proceed forward with, uh, with personnel projections and allotments. Um, because as you know, when we receive our allotments, that's based on last year's numbers, basically. And so by the time we get those out, those allotments from the state, we're, we've already increased our enrollment. And so we're, it's, it's always a game of catch up in a school system. Right. And so this, uh, you know, this is some pretty significant growth that we're trying to plan for and work with our schools on. So um, I know that we'll talk more about that or you all <laughs> will talk more about that at the retreat. So um, I just wanted to point that out. The next item um, is our personnel recommendations and not in addition to our normal um, new hires, retirements, resignations, we'll also, we also are presenting our, our list of certified recommendation uh, for the, the coming school year. So for the FY22 school year. And so you'll, you'll have that. 
Dr. B, just, just for the board to know, I have those in folders, so I'll give those to you in executive session. You'll have the weekend to look over those before Monday. Thanks, Dr. Howard. Um, the next item, uh, as you know, we as we try to um, move through our, our job descriptions, we, we've talked about this for several years now, as we either uh, post for a position that has the job description hasn't been updated in a while, or we have uh, new positions that we need to plan for, we'll bring you those job descriptions. So we have two categories of job descriptions for your review um, before the board meeting Monday night. Um, the first category are our revisions. And so I'd like to just uh, walk through and kind of give you the, the summary uh, of each. They're not um, necessarily major revisions to these descriptions, but um, if you remember back a, a year or so ago when we talked through some of these, the, the biggest missing piece for some of them is the physical requirements. And that's a piece that's really important for us to include in our job descriptions um, it, as it relates to uh, workers' comp and, and for the employee to understand what those requirements are so that they can make sure that they're physically fit for duty. So many of these are going to be because we're adding those, those physical requirements. So the first one is uh, uh, instructional coordinator. And Mr. Nicholson, I invite you to ju jump in at any time uh, if you want to add anything to what I'm sharing about this particular uh, description. But this is a <clears throat> revision of our instructional specialist uh, job description. And essentially, this is a revision to align the, uh, the essential functions of the position to the, the actual work that's being done. Did you want to Dr. speak to that? Sure, Dr. Blankenship, thank you. Um, so if you look back historically, we have like 12 different types of it. We, we have an elementary instructional coordinator. We have a, a, a literacy instructional quarter, we, a, we, a coordinator. We have a 912. And so where we've been moving underneath Dr. Blankenship's leadership, which I greatly appreciate, is that the, when you have all these different types of job descriptions and you have some similarities that you, you have a, a more broad overreaching job description and then within it you have kind of those very specific duties and responsibilities. So this is basically taking like probably the equivalent of nine job descriptions that needed to be updated and putting them into one so that we, we don't have to constantly revisit the, the individual nine and that's that's probably even a, a conservative estimate when I was looking through. So it's uh, in the way it's listed out, that could be um, by grade band, it could be by content, it could be by um, uh, special populations, ELL, special eds, and so forth. So it, it really allows us to to streamline our, our efforts, and that's the, that's the intention with that one. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. It also does include the addition of the physical requirements um, for that position. So that's that's that one. Um, the yeah. next is our, our yeah, central I was just gonna I was just going to mention to you that I, in context for our new board members, well, really for Mr. Johnson, <laughs> at our retreat, we will have an up-to-date, complete organizational chart. So once we have our org chart, we'll also be able to put these in context so the board can see how they fall into the, the overall organization as well. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, no worries. Um, the next one is our central office receptionist. And as you know, uh, Gammon is retiring uh, at the end of March. Um, we're very sad to see her uh, leave, but it's a well-deserved retirement. She's given quite a number of years, um, at least 20, um, maybe 20, maybe over 20 now um, to, to Jackson County. Um, and so this is a, a job description that had not been updated in many, many years. And so we have uh, updated it to add the um, HR duties that that the office uh, receptionist now also um, takes care of, as well as um, updating the salary schedule portion and the physical requirements. The next one is the uh, the director of leadership support and development, and. Dr. Howard, I invite you to join in on this one uh, if I miss any, any points. So this is a revision of our leadership support specialist uh, position. 
and it is uh, being revised to include some uh, some supervisory duties uh, in in the respect of assisting with evaluations of uh, building leaders uh, for the superintendent and um, and adding making sure that we had those um, physical requirements on there as well. So, Dr. Howard, did you want to add anything to that? I think we also made sure we had the salary schedule uh, information updated on that. Yes, uh, Mr. Claris and I had talked about this, or Ms. Wheeler and Mr. Claris and I met and talked through some of our job descriptions. This is one that is not something we're probably going to fill full time now, probably a half time at all, but it's kind of the equivalent in private industry of a performance coach to really work alongside our, our new leaders, especially. Yes. Uh, and also what we're finding, and even from some recent posts, we there's going to be a real significant shortage of leaders available just across the board. Um, and it's a little alarming. So we know we have work to do in developing our own pipeline. And so this is helping our performance coach for our, our existing school leaders, but also to start building a pipeline of leaders. And I think that's one of the most important things we could do right now. So. Absolutely. That and and that has been, a, I know, a, an interest of the board's uh, for a couple of years, at least a couple of years, probably longer than that, um, to develop that leader pipeline uh, within our system. And so this is a position that works with not only student leadership, but teacher leadership. Um, it could en encompass teacher induction um, at some point, as well as uh, building leadership as well. We also updated our clinic assistant job description uh, to just make sure that we were aligning with the actual duties of the clinic assistant. It added the physical requirements, but we also needed to update the terms of employment because the original job description had them working five and a half hours. And as you recall, um, a couple of years ago, we increased their, their hours to, to eight hours a day and then updated the, the salary schedule information. And then finally, the special education elementary coordinator. Um, this was revised to include specific elementary functions as well as to include the physical um, demands of the job. And Mr. Nicholson, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add on that one. Um, no, you, you covered it, Dr. B, thank you. Okay. Dr. B, let me let me just say as well that that's that would not be a new position either. That, that is, is a vacated position that Tammy uh, Miss Miss Tammy Simpson Shirley was in last year and she has graciously graciously taken on uh, the leadership of that department. So they've been they've been holding this one together, but that's that's the timing of this. Yes. And it's another job description that had not been updated in quite a number of years and and was in need of of being updated. And the clinic assistance yes. uh, is the transfer back to us. Does that take place in a few months or next school year? Great question. Mr. Clarice is asking about the clinic assistance. And so we gave them the option of coming on now if they wanted to or to wait until July. And we it's about half. Those that are coming on now, most of those were not as interested in benefits because we wanted to make sure that their salary would cover their benefits, to be honest with you. So some of them will not start until July just so that they're starting. But I, I don't know off the top of my head what the number of how many came on, how many came yeah. on. We had five uh, that came on uh, this past month. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Dr. B. Um, the next group is uh, job descriptions that will lay on the table um, for a month. And so you'll actually approve these in March. So there'll be time to um, certainly ask questions about any of these. But, but for these particularly, and they can be discussed at the, at the board retreat um, in March. So the first one is um, a job description that we've discussed before um, to, that we needed uh, to plan for, to do some succession planning. So it's not a position that's gonna be filled at this time. It's just, we're just preparing the job description for the eventuality at some point um, we, we would want to fill this. So this is for the school nutrition coordinator. Um, and it, it would be uh, 
basically under the director. So this is a position that someone could come into to learn uh, the department ins and outs and really the leadership aspect of, of directing that whole department. The next is a job description um, that is for a special education instructional lead teacher. And, uh, oh, actually I can go to that one. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, I, I haven't even been watching which ones you put up there. I've just been going through them. <laughs> so um, special education instructional uh, lead teacher. This is a position that we've sort of, we've had individuals performing these duties um, at the schools and uh, particularly at South Jackson and West Jackson elementaries because those two schools are the hubs for, for several of our special education programs that serve regionally. Um, you know, so one for the east side, one for the west side. And so this really is just codifying that work uh, into a job description for that particular individual. Um, and these are uh, positions that we uh, would hope to fill internally. And so Dr. Howard, did you want to speak to um, to anything additionally about this particular job description? Um, I will, and Mr. Hollett is joining us from afar, and so he's he had a question. I would like, if you don't mind, to go back to that as well. For, for this particular job description, um, I, I heard your explanation. I was also paying attention to what Mr. Hollett said, but the, these are critical because of the number of uh, medically fragile and emotionally fragile students in our shared services classes. And so these folks are already serving in the capacity of support at the schools. Um, and they, they are really critical to right now. It's we house most of those at West Jackson Elementary School for our West Jackson community and then South Jackson. So, uh, yes, that those are really important positions. Uh, but going back as well, just to attend to Mr. Um, Hollett's question, Mr. Hollett asked if these were filled. So uh, central office receptionist is Debbie Gammon's position and it is presently filled and we will have to obviously have to replace her. <laughs> she's she's not replaceable, but we'll have to hire for her. Um, director of student uh, leadership and support is presently not a filled position. So that's something we will discuss at our board retreat. Uh, we do have our clinic assistants already in place. Um, and then the special ed elementary coordinator is a position that we've had and it was filled up until this year when Ms. Uh, Simpson Shirley took over, but it's a vacant position that the board already has in the budget. Um, and the instructional coordinator, we have several instructional coordinators. This is just a revision to the actual job description. So um, I hope that answers Mr. Hollett's question. And, maybe yeah. he's, he's and actually, just to add, uh, Ms. Halley was in the leadership uh, development Correct. role uh, prior to uh, yes. becoming interim student support services. If you would just speak first, um, Mr. Hollett's curious, I'm sure, about these in, okay. in March. Perfect. So if you wouldn't mind getting those as well. Absolutely. He would ask me that today. And I told okay, him great. It tonight. Good. So the school nutrition, I, I'm just repeating just for, to make sure everybody Dr. B, the school nutrition coordinator is just being approved to have as a position for the future. It's not something that we're hiring right now. We'll discuss that. And just a reminder that Dr. Uh, Morris does a great job with her budget and her department is pretty much self-sustaining. So that we'll discuss that when we get to the point of talking about secession planning, unfortunately. And then the special education uh, instructional lead teacher that we presently have those leads right now at the schools. Uh, they're in they're in place. Um, and so we this is an update to the, uh, really a, a job description for the work that they've been doing. We've really treated them as special ed team leaders. For those of you who've been in, in education for a long time, they're really like team leaders at the school, but we're we're really expecting a bit more of them because of the medical fragileness and the emotional fragileness of those concentrated areas of students. And then Dr. B, the last one. The last one is the uh, job description for the chief operating officer for Empower. And, uh, you know, when we wrote the grant for Empower, we developed job descriptions. We did not bring those forth at that time, and so that we would bring them forth as we as we filled those positions or posted uh, to fill those positions. So, obviously, uh, the CEO position we brought forth, you approved, and and we hired uh, Mr. Eastler, and so now we have the Chief Operating Officer uh, position that we need to uh, bring forth to you. And so that is not a position that we 
presently have filled, obviously, but we would like to be able to fill this um, for us to open Empower next year. And so we'll discuss um, some potential um, opportunities when we're in executive session today, and we'll address that particular position during executive session. All right. And then the, the last item is um, something that I'm very excited to share with you tonight. Um, Dr. Howard will, will share the presentation in just a moment, but I just want to take a moment to say that, you know, one of the most fulfilling um, aspects of being a leader is when you can see a team take a vision from paper to implementation. And this student support services uh, team, particularly uh, with the alternative program, has really uh, taken something that was a collaborative vision that was put down on paper and presented to you all um, about a year or so ago, and you supported it. And there's some really, really exciting work that's gonna be shared tonight. Um, but also just the fact that we can highlight the work of our school uh, nurses and clinic assistants, our social workers and our counselors, because they all do a tremendous job and they have had um, many, many different circumstances to deal with this year that they don't normally deal with um, in, a, in an average school year. So I'll be quiet now, but I want to say it's a, been a privilege to, to work alongside all of these individuals. Thank you, Dr. B. And Rusty has coached me up and I think we've got it so that the sound will come through, but I will count on you to provide feedback if I've not done it correctly. Good evening, Jackson County Board of Education and Dr. Howard. I'm Jennifer Halley, Interim Director of Student Support Services. And I have a privilege to working with the student support team this school year. Dr. Selena Blankenship has been instrumental in leading the work of this department. And Jennifer Nix, administrative assistant for our department, has been a tremendous addition to our team. We look forward to sharing some highlights of our department with you tonight. For those of you who are fairly new to our Board of Education, the student support services consist of four branches, the newly established alternative program, counselors, nurses, and social workers. Our main headquarters is at Gordon Street Center. However, our school counselors and clinical assistants are housed at each school. Next, I'd like to brag on how well the alternative program is going and highlight our two teachers, Mr. Coley and Mr. Myers. The Gordon Street Alternative School staff teaches proper academic socialization, remediates learning deficits, and builds empathetic relationships within clear, firmly established boundaries. While the academic progress of these marginal students has been encouraging, the impact of our restorative practices and personal approach has produced an even more positive response from students and parents alike. If given the choice, students would overwhelmingly prefer an environment like Gordon Street Alternative School to a return to their school of origin. Following the restorative justice philosophy, students engage in small group discussions based in seven mindsets principles. In addition, students practice immediate, short-term, and long-term goal setting, then are encouraged and celebrated as they achieve individual milestones. Through close collaboration with social workers, resources to address mental and emotional obstacles are implemented where appropriate. Within the circles process, students have developed these shared values, which serve as the anchoring boundaries for classroom and interpersonal dynamics at Gordon Street Alternative School. The act of asserting what's important in a personal sense serves to solidify the meaning of these principles to each individual and elicits a much better commitment to adhering to established expectations. The end result is an accountability that brooks no dissension in the event of a student straying outside the lines since they themselves have developed the classroom social contract. Because the great majority of alternative school students are more than significantly behind in terms of credits, Scheduling is driven by individual deficits with mathematics and English taking priority. 
students actively participate in shaping their course progress using the self-awareness developed through goal setting to make decisions about the order and sequence that best fits their ultimate return to a regular classroom setting. The classroom environment at Gordon Street Alternative School is orderly, efficient, and positive, with students receiving direct instruction where needed to supplement courses delivered through the Edmentum Learning Platform. Each week, parents are updated regarding student progress via the Remind Platform. As credits are completed, they are communicated to registrars at the School of Origin, and certificates of completion are sent home to parents and displayed in the classroom as well. We currently have 18 counselors in our school system, and with it being National Counselors Appreciation Week, we would like to give a shout out to each of them for the diligent work they do for our students and staff. It's been a difficult year due to COVID-19, and our counselors have worked relentless to support the mental health issues of our students. Our schools are a better place with the continuous support of these wonderful people. We have eight counselors who serve the East Side Schools. We have we currently we have ten counselors who support the West Side Schools. We meet monthly with these counselors to discuss issues and hear from outside support agencies. Our students are in a better place because of these caring individuals. This year, Amy Bell from North Jackson Elementary and Issa Martinez with West Jackson Elementary coordinate our monthly counseling meetings. Counselors are responsible for helping to improve students' attendance, behavior, and academic achievement. We use a variety of methods to not only support the student and the family, but also the teachers working with the child. Counselors play a pivotal role in assessing students for mental health concerns, as well as assessing for abuse and neglect. The Jackson, the Jackson County School Counselors are proud of their accomplishments thus far this year. Our greatest accomplishment is the collaborative work we do with our sister schools in the district to ensure that all students in Jackson County transition smoothly between schools. The three groups of counselors meet monthly to increase our professional development and to collaborate as a group. Good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Brewer. I'm the lead nurse with Jackson County Schools. We currently have 10 clinic assistants within the Jackson County School System. We have six assistants on each side of the county. We have included their names and clinic locations. They are available all day to assist with student and staff needs during the school hours. Our department also includes Westside Regional Nurse Pam Watson and Eastside Regional Nurse Tamara Freeman, along with myself as the lead nurse. They are each assigned a side of the county and assist the clinic assistants and their schools with their medical needs. A glimpse into what responsibilities the nurses and clinic staff manage includes day-to-day -day medical needs for chronic health conditions, medications, illnesses, hearing and vision screenings, scoliosis screenings, and medical emergencies. The nurses create individual health care plans for students with chronic health conditions, attend medical IEP and 504 meetings. This year, as you know, has been a challenge. We have established pandemic teams at each school and we perform contact tracing for all positive student and staff cases. We also reach out to all our families who have been identified as a close contact. We have been able to establish relationships with our families in the community and also provide education regarding the COVID-19 virus and current guidelines.
Our three social workers are an amazing team to work with. They go above and beyond to get the job done. They have been instrumental during the pandemic with assisting schools with a variety of needs. They also help with intake meetings and any other needs we may have with the alternative program. They lead and run our monthly attendance review board meetings so smoothly each month. Thank you to our much needed social workers. School social workers use the School social workers use the approach of looking at the relationship between the student and their environment in order to assist them in reaching their fullest potential. Through assessment, crisis intervention, and coordination of community services, school social workers work with students and their families to help to identify needs and identify solutions before the issue gets bigger. Once a solution is found, school social workers help to connect families to needed resources. In addition to our regular job duties and responsibilities, we are continually working to build relationships with our community. We are involved in a number of community agencies, including Family Connection, various mental health agencies, the local Child Advocacy Center, and Reboot Jackson, to name a few. We also serve as part of the Attendance Review Board, local interagency planning team, and the Jackson County Multidisciplinary Team. For the For the 2020-21 school year, we have received 1,025 referrals. This pie chart indicates the breakdown for the amount of referrals we have received from each school. This This pie chart further breaks down the referrals we have received to indicate the type of referrals received for this school year. As you can see, attendance referrals make up the majority of referrals we have received this year. Comparatively, this time last year, 31% of our referrals were due to attendance. We feel there has been an increase in attendance referrals due to the challenges some of our families have faced in regards to COVID-19. In class In closing, I can't brag enough on all our student support staff. We are a cohesive group that will work relentlessly to do what is right for our students, families, and schools. I'm very proud to work alongside them each day. We invite you to visit us anytime to see us in action. Thank you for your time and your commitment to the betterment of the Jackson County School System. Lastly, we want to thank Dr. Selena Blankenship for her leadership in this department. We wish you the best, Dr. B, but we want you to know you will be greatly missed. All right. Thank you very much. I apologize for the um, few little glitches there. Unusual education plan for students with special needs. So an IEP may have, and, and several kids have IEPs because of health conditions. A 504 is, and it falls under the special ed umbrella, but it's not truly um, a special ed, there's not a diagnosis, but you use a 504 for accommodations or modifications for a student who may have a, a condition, but either a medical condition or um, otherwise that has to be, has to receive med some sort of modifications or accommodations. Okay. We're probably going through IEP season right now. Absolutely. <laughs> you are right about that. <laughs> You're right about that. So. I didn't realize they had so many homeless. We do have a lot of homeless kids. I, that we do. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is an excellent job. I look at this afternoon and watch it. What I'm really proud of is, is this group, what we're doing, is addressing the whole child. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about that. So many times we're, we're caught up with the math and English and social studies and science. The 
this addressed the emotional well-being, um, every other aspect of the child. If the old child is very proud of that, they did a great job of that. I wish more people would have access to that. So I, I hope that you were able to hear that, Dr. Blankenship and Ms. Hallie. Good. That, and that, that really is great work. And I think this is very timely. Um, we had another meeting actually with a state board member earlier today. I did. Um, at Martha Zoller, who is our representative. And we were talking about <laughs> that we don't even know what the what we're going to need to be able to do for our students when we come back and we're completely through this. There's just, it's going to be probably a two to five year recovery. And this generation of students is going, they're going to have implications that we don't even know of right, right now. So um, it's really, I appreciate you saying that, Mr. Johnson, and I could not agree more that it's really, really, really important. So thank Dr. you. Dr. I don't, I don't, um, just to, I know we're uh, getting short on time, but I know in speaking about the whole child, I think the alternative program is a great example of how we're doing that. And I would just love if you would take a second to share what Miss Hallie shared with us uh, yesterday about. Miss Hallie's with us. Miss Hallie, unmute if you oh, want to. She's still here. Great. Yeah, let her share. Well, we just feel like the alternative program's been very successful this year. And part of it, I think, is because the students feel very safe in their environment and they came up with their class values. And I think that slide where they have the class values printed is very, it speaks very volumes to the classroom, how we run the classroom. But we did ask, um, I asked yesterday when I was bringing their lunches in, um, we had two students that decided to stay January through May when they could have went back to their high school. And then I said, if we were to, able to offer this next year and you didn't have to come, you know, because it'll be through in May, how many of you would choose to join us again next year in this same environment? And all the students raised their hand. So we just thought that was awesome. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. We talked about that. I mean, you know, we have wonderful high schools and it, I don't think it's necessarily a reflection on the high school. It's just different children have different needs. And so these are children who this environment is better for them. And if they can find success, then we are truly personalizing their experience, which is exactly what our strategic goal is. So absolutely. Well, very good. Thank you again to that whole team. And thank you, Dr. B. And um, we, we're going to discuss those those job descriptions a little bit further at the March meeting, and we'll make sure that that's in the context of the org, org chart. And so yes. no budget implications right now at all. Yeah. Thank you, oh, Dr. Thank you. All right. Mr. Nicholson. Yes, good evening, board and Dr. Howard. I think uh, Mr. Whitworth is with us. And the first item, if I'm not mistaken, on the teaching and learning agenda actually applies to young Farmer program. So I'm going to turn it over to him to talk a little bit about the Young Farmer program. Uh, good evening, and uh, certainly one thank you for the opportunity uh, to share. Um, and I guess uh, I can kind of speak on behalf of uh, the other seven colleagues I have that teach ag in the county as well. And um, there, there's a, a really great group of ag teachers here in this county, and we, we love working together. And um, we, we have a unique opportunity, even though we're at separate schools, we were able to collaborate and do a lot of things together. And um, I, well, here's the update that I kind of shared with uh, Dr. Howard and um, Mr. Schultz. And anyway, so uh, for those of you that don't know, the Young Farmer program is a uh, it's, it's a very unique program. And the fact that it is somewhat tailored uh, to a county specific needs. But um, what we teach in, in ag ed and what, what is instilled in them uh, and the students, it, it goes beyond after graduation. And, and so my role is to um, not only work with students and also teach in, at East Jackson, but also to work with uh, adult agriculturists in the community. Um, and for me to say I love my job would be an understatement. Um, I, I truly love what I get to do and um, got to inherit a great um, situation that Mr. Schultz uh, had in place before I got here uh, and then also Dr. Burton as well. So uh, we do get to focus a lot on the livestock side of things, which um, is kind of the the bread and butter of our ag here in Jackson County uh, for the most part. And uh, our, our 
our students that show livestock are not just known around here for showing livestock, not just known in the state, but known around the nation uh, for what they do. And it, it's a neat thing to go to. I know a lot of you, you have been able to go to, to Perry and, and see our students exhibit uh, livestock. And um, I, it's not a stretch to use the word dominant uh, whenever we start talking about Jackson County uh, showing livestock down there. And um, it, it's a pretty impressive deal. And the teachers are involved, but I'll tell you, we've got a great group of families. Um, and, and what these students are doing is a family project. So with that, we, um, like I said, I inherited a really neat uh, scenario from um, or situation from Mr. Schultz and, and from Dr. Burton. And this is a cattle driven county uh, when it comes to the, the show and the livestock. And so I get to focus a lot on that. With that, the success of our students, I have been able to, um, we, we've, kind of got a reputation and for success and and doing things right and so last summer uh, I was able to do a um, three day long uh, professional learning training for other ag teachers around the state we had to do it virtually but I was able to do some filming at, at different farms and um, involve some of our students and stuff like that so that was a really neat deal if you um, which I think it's gone off the screen now but if you look through there we host shows and help support for livestock shows all throughout the year. We're talking seven to 10 shows a year that we put on. Um, specifically in December, we put on a, well, I'll start with this one. So we had our local goat and lamb show back in, back in September. And this is probably the highlight of my year, when, the 15 minutes that this takes place. So we started the local goat and lamb show four or five years ago. Uh, when Mr. Pedraza joined us, he said, hey, what about let's do a, a super special showmanship? And so you can see here we are able to pair up our uh, showmen that, that do this every weekend with some special students from our schools. And um, a lot of these, these students are repeat uh, uh, customers or, or participants, if you will, with the uh, joining us on that evening. And, and it's, it's a really neat event. If you haven't ever seen it, um, I encourage you to come. And uh, so we, we love that part of it. But so we do also do a very large event. It's called the Show Ring Showdown. It started nine years ago. We just completed our ninth show. And that would have been my first, second year in the county, maybe, um, that we started that show. And we, it started with only 150 head of, of hogs in it. Uh, we rented out a facility at, at Gwinnett County Fairgrounds. It has grown to the point that we actually now rent out the Georgia National Fairgrounds uh, hog, both hog barns and, and one of the cattle barns and their, their two big arenas down there. Um, this year, we had over a thousand head of livestock between hogs and cattle, over 500 students from eight different states. Uh, we, the furthest they came from, I believe, was Michigan this year uh, to participate in that. And then we also work with the University of Georgia to host the livestock judging contest that incorporates uh, any kid, any livestock judging teams from around the around the southeast that want to join us. So uh, really neat event there. The um, another highlight of, of what I really love that I get to do is, is work with our students in livestock judging. Um, and for those of you that don't know, it's I'll be real quick, but it's. Uh, Students are given a class of, of livestock and there will be four head of livestock in that in that class and they have to evaluate them, rank those animals and give a, within a very short period of time, have to turn around and defend their placing in a set of oral reasons. And so there's a lot of intangibles that those students learn from that, that, that particular contest. Um, the, the neat thing about that contest is we have students that earn uh, full college scholarships uh, to do that. And, and it, it sounds crazy that, that someone can go to college on a full ride judging livestock, but they can. And, and we've been very fortunate to have some students get to go do that. Uh, currently, we have countywide, we have three seniors that, that are participating in this event. Two of them have decided they want to continue on and both of them have offered full offers to go judge um, after they graduate. So uh, I apologize if you hear crying baby. We got one with RSV uh, right outside the door. but. Um, so um, and then I'll just wrap it up with this next Friday and Saturday is kind of our um, one of our last events livestock wise for the year. And that will be our um, 
it's called the Ed Talbert Memorial Livestock Show. We're going to have our students showing lambs. They'll show hogs and they'll also show cattle. Um, most of it will take place on Friday evening. Um, and then we'll roll on into Saturday morning with most of the cattle stuff as well. So, um, and I'm sure there's some folks on this meeting that have already been invited to uh, join in the honorary showmanship showdown. Those of you that have been successful in that with the cattle, we are switching it up this year and going to hogs. So it should be a little more interesting. Um, but best of luck with that. So, um, but if anybody ever wants to visit with any of the ag teachers, like I said, it's a great group of folks and, and we love working together and we've got a, uh, I personally think the best group of students in, in the county. So, um, but anyway, thank you so much. Y'all have any, thank you, Josh. We appreciate it. I hope that baby gets better for sure. Thank you. And appreciate it. Look forward to, that's a fun event. If you haven't been, you need to go. There's also, an, are you still having the cakewalk this year? Yes, ma'am. We'll do that. All right. Good. So there's a lot of, a lot of fun. Great. All right. So Mr. Nicholson. Dr. Hart, I, yeah, I was about to say, um, I, I believe the next item underneath teaching and learning leadership and performance is empower. So I will turn that over to Mr. Eastler. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson, Dr. Howard, board of education. Thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to give you an update on empower. Um, we've got a lot of really exciting things going on right now, and you know, I'm just um, counting the days till the fall when we can actually <clears throat> open the doors, get these young people in this building, and uh, really be able to do the things that we want to do. <clears throat> so I got some information for you uh, on the screen. I want to say this with a caveat, though. <clears throat> what you're looking at are preliminary numbers. Um, things are going to change. Uh, they may go up a little bit. They may go down some. Uh, the, we just began the um, scheduling process and there'll be scheduling conflicts and things like that to take place. So, But I think what this shows is it shows the level of excitement and enthusiasm for what Empower is going to bring. Uh, and uh, I tell you, our teachers are really excited about getting engaged with our students. So just want to give you a little comparison of what we're looking at currently this year uh thanks to mr schultz for pulling together the 2021 2020 2021 numbers um those numbers that you see in that first column to the right of the pathways is our our current number sitting in those classes uh and that includes eighth grade students uh you can see right now uh un or duplicated numbers. There's about 2,233 uh, bottoms in seats, like I like to call it. Those are students that are actually engaged in CTAE classrooms, um, both in the programs that are going to be offered at Empower and those that are going to stay uh, at their base schools. Um, really good numbers for a, a county the size of Jackson County, and they should be very proud. I got a little surprised when we started pulling numbers for this year, and, and I, I knew there was going to be a bump uh, in CTE because when a uh, community brings on a, a college and career academy, it kind of casts career tech in a new light and students start signing up for it. Um, but we're actually pretty much seeing that bump in year one and that's very, very exciting. So the second column uh, are the right now projected or preliminary numbers as we're just kind of going through and start the process as compared to last year's. Now, one of the other caveats I want to point out here, these do not include eighth grade students. So the numbers that you're looking at are comparing this year's current eighth through 12th grade students to next year's ninth through 12th. So again, there's going to be some fluctuation because this doesn't have any eighth grade students. And it's, it's really exciting when you see the growth, the potential growth in some of these pathways, getting close to 100 additional students in construction, healthcare increased by almost 200 students. Uh, Audiovisual technology has stayed relatively the same. Mr. Whitworth, if he was on here, would be very excited to know that we're right now over 100 more students in our high school ag programs. And again, that doesn't include the eighth graders. JROTC has a significant increase. Um, and, and most importantly is three of our new pathways. You know, we're wanting to do everything in the realm of entrepreneurship. We have close to 120 students in, in entrepreneurship. 
We're going to start growing some of our own uh, teachers, hopefully in the future. Advanced technology and engineering or manufacturing, 63 students for our first year now. That number is probably hopefully going to go up a little bit because we're, we're trying to recruit a few more students. But I'm thrilled to death that we have that many students already in that program. Uh, we've got some work to do in supply chain management and logistics. We do have a few students in there, but when you when you compare what our projected numbers are for next year, again, there's going to be a little bit of fluctuation. Again, knowing that eighth grade students are not in these numbers, we're already at over 700 more students that are participating in these programs. Now that is duplicated students. Um, I did run some numbers with some reports in Infinite Campus. That uh, 2,223 student or spots, spaces, uh, equates to getting close to 1,500 students right now that would possibly be at Empower next year. Um, we, I know that there were times where we were talking about the possibility of maybe only around four or 500 students. I was hoping around 700. Um, my gut feeling is we're probably going to wind up somewhere around 1,200 or so, but this is just absolutely exciting um, news for the community. And I think uh, what it shows is the investment that the Board of Education has given to the future of our students and to the future of workforce, it's gonna pay off. Now, the caveat to that is um, we have to now change the student experience. And we're uh, beginning that work with our Empower teachers, um, and with a leadership team, which we have kind of put together of some of those folks that may or even may not wind up at Empower when, when the whole thing is said and done, but we're really gonna focus on taking the structure that Mr. Nicholson and his team has built um, with the expectations in the classroom for great learning and start to roll out the project-based learning component of that um, to truly, and, and if you talked, if Jeremy Peacock was on here, he would tell you, that you know you don't just one day say you're going to do project-based learning and the next day have it start it's actually a journey that will take hopefully us probably about three years to get full implementation and then have everything just running perfect by the end of five years but again that's the beginning of uh, changing that whole student experience we also want to build a culture of excellence a culture of with our teachers with our students we want to bring another level of professionalism and collegiality to our students. Um, we're gonna go through a book study with the faculty that's called the Energy Bus and making sure that everybody is heading in the right direction um, with the same goals and, and expectations for experiences. Um, and, and when students walk in that door, they're gonna feel different, they're gonna be treated different, and they're gonna be able to experience their classes in a different way. We're also engaging a lot of uh, businesses and industries right now in the curriculum development and the equipment, uh, particularly around healthcare, advanced technology and engineering and supply chain management and logistics. Um, we've partnered with 365 Degree Marketing and they are developing a very solid, or not developing a brand, we had a brand, but what they're helping us do is helping us to capitalize and make sure that everybody understands what that brand is that the Empower uh, College and Career Center brings. They also worked with us on that student video that was put out there. I'm so proud of our students from East Jackson and Jackson County. We kind of asked them to step into a actor's role and pretend that they were at Empower already. And they did an absolutely phenomenal job with that. We have got a powerhouse board of directors and right now they're working on a very um, major fundraiser, which will be held at Chateau Alain uh, on April the 10th. It is a black tie affair and it's not your typical black tie affair. They are going after and, and inviting some high dollar potential investors to come into Empower to, to get them excited about what we're doing here in Henry County or Henry County, Woo, went back in the past, sorry about that, Jackson County because uh, this is much better than Henry County, let me just say that, um, but uh, to really invest their money into um, the Empower College and Career Center. And the final thing I just want to mention here real quick um, is I believe obviously we can't do this uh, just as adults. We've got to bring students along 
Uh, and I believe that we can do that through a student ambassador program. And we've developed an application process, a teacher recommendation form, and uh, we're probably going to roll that out this spring also where we can go ahead and identify hopefully two students from each grade level from each high school. So a total of four students from each grade level that will become really the face of Empower to all of the visitors, all of the tours. Uh, the, they'll be the student leadership team that are is the voice of their peers in the school building um, and, and really be able to promote the Empower Center, not only within the community, but also back in their school buildings. They they become those advocates for, for students in those school buildings. So we have a whole lot going on. I could probably talk all night long on this, but I won't uh, take up any more time unless you have any other questions that you would like to ask about uh, what we have happening. I just want to say it sounds very exciting. I'm really thrilled about the progress that we're making. I Thank you. Can you, what's the timeline on the, you mentioned the, the students and their selection. What's the next step as we you know, finish this year and start the new year? When will they get another shot at, at picking and making final selections or has that already been done? So, Mr. Did you hear that team? Yes, Mr. I did. Mr. Um, I'm happy to answer. You can. We, Go our, ahead. Our students have gone through the selection process. They've already selected courses and there's a team of school leaders who have spent two and a half full days now and they are basically hand scheduling all the kids because they're trying to be, they're trying to take what students first choices were for their CTAE classes and making sure that we get students in the courses that they want to be. So we they're going to work again on Wednesday and they already have the CTAE schedule done. So there's no conflict. So if the student needs. And so it's a very tedious project, a very tedious timeline. And I see um, Mr. Western. I don't know if Ms. Palmer's here or not, but they have a team of folks that are working on that. But I expect we will have that by the end of February because that will be that will drive our personnel conversations with right. you. So um, and our students will know by, by early March what their schedule will look like. And so that is the work of February. It is really, really intense right now. And Any Dr. Howard, just to add to that, I mean, again, if there's a student that, that you know, it's not going to be a wholesale change, but if there's a student that comes to us and says, I didn't really understand what this was, uh, you know, can I have a shot? I'm sure we could. Uh, again, I'm going to echo what Dr. Howard said with this powerhouse of, of assistant principals and APIs and Martha and Sandy Aiken that are working on this and our principals. Uh, I mean, we've just got a great team that's working together for the benefit of the students. And, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to um, do what's right for the students when they need it to be done. Does that answer it? Yep, very much. Thank yes, thank you. Um, underneath Empower, um, I see we have Mr. Schultz and uh, Mr. Eastler here. And so a conversation and a decision point we need to we need to discuss and we'll talk about it a little bit further in in the executive session because it involves personnel. But the recommendation uh, based on a very careful evaluation of both of our programs is that Empower be the location of the Empower Jackson ROTC. And so that each high school would not have their own at their base school, but we would combine our ROTC and you would still have an East Jackson flag and a Jackson County flag. So they would have representation, but that we would have one ROTC for all of Jackson County and it be based at Empower. So there's an executive summary that I'm going to share with you and talk about. Um, th this would, however, require us to do a consolidation of programming, which would reduce one of our senior officers because this would be one organization instead of two organizations. So it's it's something that we need to talk about and think through. Um, our both of our high schools are aware that we're having this conversation. I, we have spoken to both this, both of the officers. They know that we're evaluating this, and Mr. Um, Mr. Schultz has worked with uh, the Army. But the organization and so they are they are familiar with with what our approach is and so I'll speak a little bit more to that during executive session because it impacts an individual and it ultimately results in a RIF or reduction in force so we would um, actually be reducing one of our army officers but this is this is our recommendation uh, honestly and and again I was at um, East Jackson today and had a had a great conversation but the recommendation in Todd Schultz. Rec um, 
pipe in if you want to add. But the recommendation to be able to sustain a program is to have about 200 kids in a program, 150 to 200. East Jackson's numbers have slowly trended up a little bit, but they're still less than 100 kids. They're, they're 50 to 80 kids. And so that's we have two full-time positions over there, and it's very hard to sustain the whole program when you don't have enough numbers to fill all of the, the Jackson counties is about 200 students. And so if we combine them, then we will have we we hope to have 300 students, which is a, a full scale ROTC. Um, and so that's that's, again, something that we need to talk about. Um, we've got some options. It's a, it's a recommendation. It's something y'all need to think about. It's hard to fathom for me because I remember when we opened East High and we worked so hard to get an ROTC there and we wanted to make sure that we had equitable at both schools. Um, and what I think is this is equitable. It's just not in two different places. It's one strong powerhouse of an ROTC. They'll still compete as East High and Jackson County High. But Todd, is there anything you want to add to that? Or well, I was just going to say too, like you said, that 100 is like a minimum is what they say that they should have for a program. I mean, a very minimum. And we've really been, I mean, we are going up at East, but we've been below that now for, for quite a few years now. Um, but, but you also say 10% of your population, just because really the cost effective, not only for our system, but also for the, the actual army themselves to run it. Um, another thing is, is just the facilities alone of what we have at Jackson County uh, and what we can do with that facilities. Um, they have already built um, part of a, a, an obstacle course right there in the back of JRTC um, at Jackson County High School. Um, they would have the gym, they'd have a lot of these different places that would work extremely well with the number of cadets. And it's kind of like when you have a larger group, you actually have the ability to do more programs with those kids. So um, it's a benefit for the students. Um, we do, we would be losing a senior officer, but we would more than likely qualify for a, what they call a non-commissioned um, officer um, to come in in that replace. So we would still be looking at a total of four individuals running the program. So I'll provide, go ahead, Ms. Anglin. I was just thinking they're going to be, if they were in, in empower they're going to be one anyway so i don't see that it would make a big difference but i think they will become one mm -hmm. they'll become a group you know instead right. of east and jackson then they'll grow together that's just my thinking would they still have opportunities to be like i know that the different high schools the two high schools they perform at different yes. events and things. Yes. Would that still be an option? Or? Yes. Did you hear that question, Todd? Yes. And that was one of the things that we really wanted to make sure that they would have rep representation back at both of their high schools. Um, you know, they would still be doing opening ceremonies. They would still be doing the fly. They would still do all the events at each school. Um, it will take coordination from the actual officers and, and our, our leaders and our instructors um, to make sure that they keep that open chain of command, you know, chain back and forth, especially with the principals and things like that. Um, but that is one thing we wanted to make sure, even though we're going to one, each school will have the representation for a students that are participating in the JRTC. So we can talk further about that if you want. I mean, that's that's what we've recommended. We've really been worried over the past couple of years that we were going to lose the East High ROTC um, just because of the numbers. And the Army watches that really, really carefully. And so um, this, we feel like, is a way to provide it without risking loss of those students having access. So, um, And then, Mr. Nicholson, I'll turn it back over to you to for Connect Academy. Sure. I realize the last two items on the agenda stand between you and the board in an executive session and dinner and in your own home. So I'll, I'll try to be brief, but there are, these are two pretty critically important items that I, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about. I, I believe it was back in November or December where we, we front loaded you with three uh, preliminary executive summaries and one was Chrome, a Chromebook replacement plan. One was around Connect Academy and one was around the um, technology infrastructure update. So I want to start by giving you a brief update with Connect Academy. This has been a very quick from concept to implementation. It's only been about three weeks. 
And so the, the initial um, interest inventory that we sent out there for anybody in the rising third through eight, we received about 300, a little over 300 st uh, students. And it was pretty evenly split, split, split in elementary and middle school in terms of around 147, 153 roughly at both grade bands. So we, we had about 300 families that were interested in this. Last Monday and Tuesday, we held two teacher meetings and two parent meetings. And we set initially our first student uh, application deadline for essentially, uh, it's basically this, this evening <laughs> at, at midnight, uh, hopefully nobody's staying up at midnight, um, comp you know, submitting an application. But we wanted to see like, what's the quick turnaround? Who's gonna be interested? Right now we have around 100 students in that just one week turnaround. Um, so teaching and learning is going to spend tomorrow morning going through looking at the applications, determining who would be a good fit for the round two for students. And that round two is an online interview process, kind of like what we're doing here with a Google Meet, making sure that students are, are um, just real comfortable in an online learning environment. And then our teacher deadline is not until Sunday evening. Um, and so one of the things that I, I, I want to let anybody know that's watching is that we've had a lot of questions around, well, I'd like to just continue with my online learning experience at my base school. It might, might I hesitate to say homeschool because people think you're referring to homeschool, but like uh, Gum Springs or East Middle or whatever your base school is. And in a post pandemic world where, where we're, you know, our goal is to bring all kids back in person as we already have right now, Connect Academy really is the elementary and middle school distance learning model. We're centralizing it. We, we're identifying teachers that that they've just really found their niche. And we're, we're doing the same thing for students where some students, they can't wait to be back in person. We get that. We understand that. We support that. But for some students, the flexibility of learning at their own pace in their own location, um, that, that's just been a much better environment for them. And so really for us with Connect Academy, it's while it is based on distance learning, really the core elements of this have less to do with distance learning and have more to do with personalization. And, and, have, and so the message we shared with our, our, um, our parents and our teachers is about students taking ownership and having a, a, a personalized learning plan, uh, demonstrating how they, they would like to indicate that they've mastered a standard, learning along a continuum. So our, our, we're on track with what we shared with you the other week. Uh, the one thing that I'll, that I'll say is that, um, you know, our timeline was pretty aggressive because we're trying to be very respectful of the fact that if we're pulling students from, from our, our schools uh, and we need teachers to teach those students, we want to make sure that if we're pulling really amazing teachers to teach at Connect, that we give our principals ample time to be able to replace those teachers. So. We're, we're gonna continue with our, our, our round one closing tonight for students and round one closing uh, Sunday evening for, for teachers. And then we will evaluate and look at the number of applicants we have. And in our, in our initial plan, we had uh, a round two as well to, to make sure that, again, folks know that really, if you're interested in a distance learning environment at elementary and middle, this is it. You keep hearing me say elementary and middle. I can, Mr. Wester is on my, my screen. I'm sure Ms. Palmer's on here too, but I can see his face right there. Uh, high school is a way more complicated scenario. Um, so we're not saying that, that there will be no distance learning in high school. It's just, we, we're not prepared as a district to say that we're centralizing all high school distance learning right now. Um, it, and, and that that is just a, a reasonable, <laughs> to, to, to claim that you could do that in a, a couple months would, would be, um, it probably would not come to fruition. So we want to just make sure that our parents and anyone, students in high school know that, is there an opportunity to learn online? We're not shutting that down by any stretch of the imagination, but we're not having a uh, centralized, orchestrated, uh, formalized approach for that. And to kind of connect with Mr. what Mr. Eastler shared, I mean, there are going to be scenarios where somebody might be an empower and they just need to pick up a class and, and they wanna spend all day at Empower on one day and all day at their base school on another day, but they just need a history class or they just, you know, they need one class where online learning might be an ideal situation for them. So that's that's kind of our growth area for that. 
but just wanted you to know since we shared the executive summary, just where we are and, and what we'll be able to do is certainly by the March retreat, let you know how many folks have been selected for, for Connect Academy and talk a little bit about the teacher allocations that we would need for that. So I'm gonna pause right there, see if, if there are any questions. Uh, if not, I'll jump into the next item, but I'll, I'll pause for a minute. Looks like no questions. All right, wonderful. Well, again, when we gave that that uh, executive summary a couple months ago that had three items, the third item was about uh, technology infrastructure. And, and you do have an executive summary in there. Um, this really is, is around the fact that some of our, I, I love analogies. So it's like, we've got the Audubon coming into, the Audubon of the internet coming into our school system. And we actually have the Audubon that goes in between one school to the next school, but you have really outdated traffic lights. <laughs> Mike, if that's not a good analogy, you can come back around and, and correct me. But, but essentially we've got, we've got two things that are kind of holding up our, our speed and our capacity to, to live up to the, the full potential of the, the internet feed. And one is our switches, some of which, is, is we, as I mentioned, we shared a couple months ago, are 10 years old. And the other are some of our access points. Um, I, I can guarantee those of you that have walked around within a school, you'll, you'll, you'll be on one hallway and all of a sudden everything, like if you're looking at your phone, you've got, I mean, you can get your internet, you get everything real quickly and then you go down and you think, oh, it's because I'm in the basement. It really isn't because you're in the basement because you're on our, our, on our, our network. It's because the, the access points or the switch that you're now picking up your feed are outdated. And so um, when we put out an RFP with the high school, the bid for the new high school, Mr. Summer and team went ahead and added the, uh, an, an additional RFP specifically to upgrade our switches and our access points that were outdated. And, and the nice thing about that is that this is, we're not asking you for additional money. And actually the vendor has already been approved uh, because it's the same vendor that, that was approved for the high school. But this is, this is E-rate and the beauty about E-rate is that the school system only has to pay 30% of the total costs. So it's a really, really wise way to spend your money on technology infrastructure. So hopefully you've had access and had a chance to look at this, but uh, Mr. Summer, if I've missed something, maybe you could just kind of um, follow back around me to, to indicate from a more technology savvy standpoint. Well, you did an awesome job, Mr. Nicholson. Um, but actually, uh, Todd is right with the Audubon analogy. Um, we've spent year, the last few years putting new teacher laptops, Chromebooks, and all of those have a one gigabyte network interface. The switches we're wanting to replace and the access points have a capacity of 100 meg. So although the laptop may be 10 times faster than the switch, it's only going to go as fast as the switch allows it. So we have some tremendous bottlenecks inside of all of our schools. And, uh, you know, this uh, E-rate project, this uh, infrastructure project, it, it's kind of a way to balance it, especially with Empower coming online and the Connect Academy, and there's gonna be a lot of virtual. It's just been a tremendous load on the network. So like Todd, uh, excuse me, Mr. Nicholson said, the money's there, we're not asking for that. The vendor, it's just really an informative, uh, to let you know we're doing everything we can to, to put the best tools in our teacher's hand and, and where our kids can be successful as well. Thank you, Mr. Summer. So Dr. Howard and board, if you have questions, we're happy to answer them. Any questions? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it is a great deal. So. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Nicholson, and to everyone in that, that shared tonight. We, we provided the board a lot to think about, probably more than they cared to think about, but um, we appreciate their attentiveness and uh, especially the highlight of our students and uh, the work that's happening with student support. That was a, a real highlight. So we appreciate everyone's time. Um, we That's all the superintendent's comments, so I will turn it back over to Mr. Clarcy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Uh, we'll move into the next segment. Executive session, we do have a need uh, for an executive session to discuss personnel. Um, a motion to move into executive session. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Move into executive session. All right. Now